So hi everyone, welcome to today's Conservation Optimism webinar. Um, we're really excited today for a really cool webinar, another, another great one. So Conservation Optimism is a movement that attempts to steer away all the narratives about conservation that are sort of a bit sad and a bit sort of the doom and gloom and go towards more positive narratives to inspire change and empower, act, empower people and inspire action. So this is our monthly webinar of, of, of May. We do one every single month. So make sure that you look out for those, but we also offer a variety of different resources. There are podcasts, there are resources for kids. You can check this out on our website, um, which is, if you just Google conservation optimism, you'll easily be able to find it. Um, but also on all the social media, if you have positive stories, make sure to um, add the hashtag conservation optimism to your tweets or to your Facebook posts, and we'll try and reshare those. Um, so today we're really excited. So just remember to mute yourself. Um, today we're really excited to be talking with Felipe and Gabriella from the Lowland Taper Conservation Initiative, who are going to talk to us all about um, Lowland Taper conservation and the work that they do. So um, on that note, I'll let them introduce themselves and I think we can start the talk today. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and be able to talk a little bit about our work with the Lowland Taper in Brazil. Uh, my name is Felipe. I'm a biologist. Uh, I did a, a master in applied ecology, uh, the same as Julia, that is from the Conservation Optimism team uh, back in 2013. So I guess it's really nice to, to be here today and be able to join our organizations in this kind of event. Uh, so let's start. I will, I will give, give the floor to Gabriela. She's the geneticist of our team and she will start the talk. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. Um, so we are going to start talking about the 25 years of tapir conservation efforts in Brazil. So first, what is a taper? <laughs> um, I, I have taught a few times in the US um, and I asked my students if they know what a taper is and many of them did not know. Um, I do think that um, we have uh, a selected group here that probably knows what a taper is, but we are going to uh, introduce them anyway to you. Um, so if you don't know what a taper is, now you're going to see what you have been missing. Go ahead, Felipe. Okay, so this is a taper. Um, this is an adult taper. Um, they have this snap that is pretty flexible and they can um, handle fruits and leaves. Um, they are herbivores and uh, eat fruits as well. And they are big, as you can imagine from the photo. They are actually the, the largest land mammal in Brazil and South America as well. And uh, next slide. And this is a baby taper. So um, this photo is the cutest photo of this presentation. So enjoy. And um, I think that this is enough already reason to um, conserve them. <laughs> they are pretty adorable, those little fluffy striped things. And um, since you saw already a taper, uh, an adult taper and a baby taper, I'd like you to guess um, who is the closest related animal to taper. So I'm going to give you three options, okay? Um, so elephant, rhinos, or deer. If you can type in the chat, um, just so I have an idea of what you guys are thinking. Got a rhino. Got a deer. Nice, I have like a, a, a good range of answers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool, so next slide. So um, people that thought uh, wrote rhino, you got it right. So the rhinos are the closest related to tapers. And then after the rhinos um, comes the zebras and horses. This photo that uh, we are showing you from the tapers, this is a lowland taper. Um, this is the one that we study, but actually we have three other species of tapers. Um, so in the, in the bottom left, uh, we have the Andean species that occurs in the Andes. 
The black and white one is the Malayan taper, and the remaining one is the Burgess taper. It's a kind of a weird name to say. Um, they are from Central um, America. They occur in Central America. All right, next slide. So tapers, they are considered solitary animals, but they do pair up, of course, during the reproductive season. And we have observed the same pairs um, pairing up um, through consecutive reproductive seasons. So we don't know yet if they are um, fully monogamous, uh, monogamous during that time, um, but our, our genetic results are going to show light on this uh, insight. And we suspect that they are having more fun than, than what we can measure, actually. <laughs> Go ahead. And um, tapers, they, um, for every gestation, they generally um, produce one baby, but we do have cases of twins. And each gestation um, is about 13 months long. So one, three months long. Go ahead. So they are excellent swimmers and um, they hope they can hold their breath for a long time. So if you have the opportunity to just um, put uh, on YouTube a video of tapers swimming in the water, especially the ones with this um, clear, very clear rivers, there are some awesome videos that you can see that they actually walk under the river, on the bottom of the river, it's pretty cool. Go ahead. Felipe, I think you need to unmute yourself for that. Sure. Um, let's start again. Yeah. Can you I don't hear think, it? I don't think you can hear it. I cannot hear it. So, um, no. Unfortunately, no. The videos are the best thing to not work during presentations, right? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So it's, it's pretty sad because it's an adorable sound that they make. They, they have little calls that are, um, that you would not expect a 250 kilo mammal to um, have such a, a sweet sound. It's, it's very cool. Um, we can share the, the link to, the, to a video later on this. Okay, go for it. And who we are. So we are a small team of five people. You can go ahead, Felipe. Um, and we have one vet, that's Paola, that's, that Felipe is, is showing with the arrow, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then after that, um, we have Zé. Zé is our field expert. Then Felipe and I, and uh, we are both biologists. And Patricia. Patricia is our leader. She's the founder of um, the Lowland Taper Conservation Initiative. She founded it 25 years ago and she has been leading it since. Um, she's a great science communicator, uh, much better than us, and, but you're going to have to stick with us for today. <laughs> Just go ahead. And um, as I said before, we are just a, a small group um, of people, we have a small team. So, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we studied many aspects of taper um, ecology and behavior and conservation. And so we would not be able to do that by ourselves. We have, uh, we are very lucky to have so many collaborators. Um, this slide with, it's just showing a small sample of them really. Um, people with very uh, different areas of expertise and are willing to discuss and analyze our data with us. So now it's, um, well, now that you know what is a, a taper is and who we are, uh, why did we decide to study tapers? Why do we care for them? Uh, first of all, uh, back in 1996, when Patricia started the project, very little was known about this species and wild. Most of the information came from the zoos, but this is extremely important species in the uh, ecosystems where they occur. Uh, they are known as gardeners of the forest. They are the biggest uh, seed dispersal uh, on South America. So they have this important role. And by uh, 
dispersing seeds and uh, browsing leaves and uh, trampling, they have the capacity to uh, shape and maintain the structure and the biodiversity of the ecosystem uh, where they are uh, occurring. That is mainly the tropical rainforest in South America. Uh, they are also known as umbrella species, so they need large areas to survive. And if we focus on conservation actions in these species, we are, of course, conserving a lot of other uh, species uh, under the umbrella. Uh, a study of a colleague of ours, uh, they showed in Amazon that uh, the seed dispersal also has the right direction. So they bring seeds from the primary forest to the secondary forest. So they also help uh, restoring uh, degraded ecosystems. And one study conducted by us in the Atlantic forest in a, a state park that is a patch of forest, uh, we realized that um, the forest is actually losing biodiversity because it's just a, a path of forest, but uh, large mammals, large herbivores like tapirs are, um, are slowing down this process. So they act as a buffer. Uh, are you hearing me okay? Because my internet is a bit slow. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, they are really, really important in the, for the environment, for the tropical forest, but of course they are facing several threats. The main one is deforestation, habitat loss. Uh, in Brazil, this is especially for open lands to large-scale agriculture and, and husbandry, uh, agriculture of uh, corn, uh, soya bean, cotton, sugarcane. And this brings some other problems such as pesticide contamination. We also uh, uh, we, we start to build new roads to export our product, the production of grains. So road kill is one big problem for tapers. Poaching uh, in Brazil is not allowed to hunt, but they are poaching basically everywhere, especially in Amazon, and really, really, really little control of uh, the environment. And fire. Unfortunately, due to climate change, Brazil is getting drier and drier especially some uh, uh, biomes such as Pantanal and fire is becoming an uh, uh, increasing danger. So because of this, unfortunately, this species is listed as vulnerable to extinction by the IUCN uh, red list. And as I, uh, we said, it's a really important species, it's facing many threats, so we have to do something, we have to care about them. That's why, why, uh, why we decided to study them. And, All right, uh, so I'm um, starting with the LTCI history and sites. So just a brief, um, brief explanation of how everything started. Go ahead. So uh, this map is showing the main biomes in Brazil that tapers occur. So tapers occur in the Amazon, in the Cerrado, in Pantanal and Atlantic forests. These are the four biomes that they occur. This um, area in yellow um, is the biome Caatinga, and um, tapers used to um, occur there, but are considered uh, locally extinct. And then um, we first started in the Atlantic Forest with, uh, that, that, that was where Patricia did her PhD, and I'm sure that she fell in love with tapers um, a lot a long before that, but that, this is when it started. And then we moved on to the Pantanal, and then to two areas in the Cerrado. In last year, we started exploring the Amazon. We have three sites in the Amazon. So um, of course we cannot cover the entire distribution of tapers, which is, uh, it's pretty big, but um, we have at least um, sites on the four different um, biomes that they occur. And so starting with the Atlantic Forest, um, just a brief ex uh, explanation of the Atlantic Forest. You can go ahead, Felipe. Thanks. Um, so the Atlantic Forest is a hotspot for biodiversity. Um, about 8% of the world's total species is there, including many um, endemic and endangered species. Um, unfortunately, it's highly fragmented and still under anthropogenic pressure. And uh, this is where the largest urban centers are in Brazil. 
Um, and just so you have an idea of how, um, how difficult is the situation for the Atlantic forests, we have about 12% of what, what it was originally. So forest has been cleared uh, mainly for timber, firewood, firewood, charcoal, agriculture, cattle ranching, and the construction of the cities. And then our second place that we study, the second biome, is the Pantanal. The Pantanal is a very, very beautiful place. If you didn't have the chance um, to go there, you should. Um, it's the largest continuous freshwater wetland on the planet. So it's, um, it has an extraordinary concentration and abundance of wildlife. And we consider this place a uh, tapers in paradise, it's especially the place that we study. Um, they, we consider this, this place uh, with, with optimal conditions for tapers to have a very good life there. Um, and so we, we use this population as a control population, you know, to, um, to be able to compare um, to other populations facing different kinds of threats. Um, but the Pantanal as a whole uh, is also facing um, some very serious threats that um, just so you can have an idea, 2.6% of the Pantanal is under protection. So about 3% and 95% is privately owned. Um, the, main, the main problem that it is facing is the change of the traditional methods of low intensity cattle ranching that uh, were considered sustainable to a more in intensive methods um, to increase production. This change is, is causing also um, overgrazing and the substitution of native grasses uh, by exotic grasses. Another thing it faces is fire, which um, Philippe is going to say a little bit more about it later. Okay. And then we go to, our, to the Cerrado, which is our next. Um, we have two sites in Cerrado. The Cerrado is the most extensive uh, woodland and savanna um, of South America. It has a, a mix of different vegetation types, um, tree, tree and scrub savanna, grassland, and closed canopy forests, which generally are pretty dry. The species there are well adapted to extensive periods of drought and fire. And fire is part of the ecology of the this, this species. But as we observed in we observed in California, the fires are starting to become more and more common um, in a frequency that, that starts not to be a, a good thing. Um, it has a high biodiversity. It's considered the global biodiversity hotspot and is under severe threats from the rapid expansion of agriculture and husbandry activities. It is considered um, currently uh, the epicenter of economic development of Brazil. And uh, we observe a lot of roadkill in Cerrado. This is something that is calling a lot of attention. Um, just so uh, you can have an idea, it's uh, from 2015 to 2018, we um, collected samples from 335 tapers um, that were dead along the highways. And we were just um, going, uh, studying a few roads in one state in Brazil. You can go ahead. And the Amazon, the Amazon is probably the biome that's most familiar to most of you. Um, it is a, a moist tropical forest and it covers about 40% of the land in Brazil. So it's a huge, huge um, forest and it houses at least 10% of the world's known biodiversity. And there's a lot of things to discover there as well. It's rivers account for um, 15 to 16 of the world's total river discharge into oceans. And um, it is suffering with the rapid decrease of human population increase in large scale agriculture and cattle ranching. Um, this is a map that you can see uh, the area of deforestation. Um, there's still a lot of forests, but the rate of devastation is, is um, pretty alarming. And uh, this is also happening, especially because uh, due to the production of vast quantities of commodities for exportation, for example, beef and leather, timber, soy, oil and gas and minerals. There are a lot of mining activity going on in the, in the Amazon as well. Go ahead. 
And um, so our sites in the Amazon, we have three sites. One of them is with large scale agriculture. The other one is the mining. Um, we have this other sites that is highly impacted by mining. And the next one is um, with palm oil. So we chose three sites that, um, that are impacted by, um, by the main the main threats uh, to Amazon to see how the tapers are doing in those places. Go ahead. You are muted. Thank you. <laughs> so okay, we so now uh, Gabriela showed where we are. Uh, taking actions in Brazil, uh, different parts uh, uh, in different biomes. Uh, and you know uh, that we study tapers, but how exactly we do this? What we do with them in each site? We have two main aims uh, in the LCTI. One is uh, research. So for us, it's really important to collect uh, really uh, high quality data in order to, to have enough information to do good populations assessments and be able to understand uh, how the population is doing, what the, the main threats for the population in, in this specific area, in this specific biome. And then we, can, uh, we are able to, to, to do effective conservation actions. And another main aim of, uh, that we have is uh, about communication. We, we want to spread our uh, data, we want to spread our results, we want that people understand the importance of uh, of the taper the importance of the environment uh, protection so we do it uh, uh, doing several things such as environmental education scientific tourism communication and training and capacity building so research how we how we do uh, uh, study tapers they are kind of uh, kind of uh, hard to study they are elusive nocturnal they occur in low densities so the main method is uh, capturing them. We set different kinds of traps. This one is the box trap, is the most su successful uh, way that we have to capture them. We use salt as bait because they, they need the, to supplement their diet uh, with minerals, so they are really attracted to salt in some places. So when, once they get used to the trap, they go there quite often. And when I, we are in the field, uh, we set them and sometimes we, we are able to trap tapers. So here we got paper, now we can start study them. We also have another methodology that is not easy at all to use. Uh, we use pitfalls and yes, we dig huge uh, holes in the, on the ground. Uh, they are two meters deep and uh, in the trails where the tapers are used to, to, to walk and sometimes they, they fall inside and, and then we catch them. Or we also, uh, by sighting them on the field, we, we use, uh, we shoot dartings. If we want to capture, we use uh, an aesthetic darts. But if, if we want just to, to get some sample, for example, for genetics, we use uh, biopsy darts. And why we capture them? So the main tool that we use is the GPS collar. It's a uh, widespread the use of this uh, equipment to study wildlife and it gives us really important information about habitat use about how tapers and move through the landscape we were saying that uh, in different parts we want to know we, tr we want to try to understand how they are using like the uh, palm uh, crops or the soya bean crops or how they are moving in this mining site so this is a really important tool that we have and this is the home branch areas that were uh, estimated for uh, tapers in different uh, places where, where we study them. So this is in uh, Atlantic Forest, this is in Cerrado, and this is in um, Pantanal. The Pantanal, as we, uh, Gabriela said, is our control uh, population, so we have much more information about them there. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap. So tapers, they are solitary, but they do, uh, uh, share this, their place with other from the same species, but not at the same time. So if you find two tapes at the same time in one place, uh, if they are not related, uh, normally they will fight. 
but normally one table will pass here and use this uh, environment and then another one later will pass so this is the way how they share the uh the, the landscape how they share the their range uh, since the beginning of the project we already captured 182 different individuals in all different uh, uh biomes in amazon we just started so we had now seven captures or eight uh, and since the beginning, we installed 111 uh, radio callers uh, on uh, radio callers or GPS callers. Uh, now, more uh, recently, the, with the technology, uh, we use GPS. Uh, so, in the, in the beginning, we, we start with the radio callers. So, we installed the, uh, 111 in all these papers. Another really important uh, tool that we use is camera tracking. In Pantanal, our main population, our population control, we've been monitoring them uh, since 2010 with a, a grid of camera traps. And last year, we were able to expand to 100 camera traps. So they bring us really refined data about papers. They're really important for us. Uh, first, we are able to recognize uh, several individuals uh, using, for example, scars or uh, skin patterns or, of course, the radio caller when, when they're using them. And we get information uh, of uh, social structure or of how they, uh, they behave, but also we get information, uh, for example, of interbirth interval. So how long one female takes uh, to give birth to another calf. Uh, we get uh, information about the mortality rates of the young, uh, the calves, for example, if, we start to see one calf and it suddenly disappear. It's probably dead. Uh, we can get information about dispersal, about mortality of adults. So all this information is really important for us because with this, we can make uh, population viability analysis and uh, try to understand if the population is stable, if the population is increasing, decreasing, and what, we can, uh, what are the, uh, the threats that they are facing and how we can act. But there's also another part of the project that is uh, really important for us at uh, research that this help and uh, Gabriela will, will keep going. Yes, so we studied several aspects of taper health. Um, they are listed here, some of them, not all. Um, so blood counts, biochemical profile, microbiological profile, urinalysis, infectious diseases, we look for parasites, um, we measure um, the concentration quantity of microplasts in taper samples, and we also do toxicology. Um, I'm going to expand a little bit on toxicology because it has gained some space in our, um, some more space on, on our thoughts in the L2CI because we recently published, you can go ahead, please. We recently published a paper about lowland exposure to pesticides and metals, heavy metals, in the Cerrado. And um, for that, we used um, we used the, the carcasses, um, tapir carcasses that we would find along the highways, um, and then we would sample them um, for the, the the carcasses that were in a, a good state, um, a fresh enough state. We would um, do a full necropsy. And we found in these necropsies um, that 90%, um, we did uh, 25 necropsies, by the way, 90% um, um, of these individuals had um, some kind of abnormality in the kidney or liver. And um, from the, the, the 87 um, individual samples, uh, we also found um, contaminants in high concentrations and um, some in dangerous concentrations and even um, illegal pesticides as well. And this is particularly important in the moment of Brazil because we are the largest consumers um, among the, large, the world's large consumers, consumers of um, agrochemicals. And 30% um, of the active ingredients are already forbidden in the EU. So um, this is particularly important, um, especially because um, the, the, the laws that the government are trying to um, make easier to get permits to use more agrochemicals. And so this is just the start of, um, of a fight that um, we are thinking about um, expanding the sampling 
um, to humans um, to see uh, if tapers um, can be used as indicators of um, contamination in humans as well. And getting samples from humans and seeing contamination in humans will also call more, call more attention for this problem. Um, we also collect um, poop feces, well, feces and poop are the same thing. So uh, we collect feces samples. Um, this is a particularly fresh one, green, very greenish. It's uh, one that we like to find um, to extract hormones for um, to understand better about reproduction and uh, also extract cortisol to have some idea of um, how is the level of stress of the individuals. And uh, we also do some analysis of nutrition to understand better the nutrition. I do see one question here about um, using genetics through poo um, for density estimation. So um, we, uh, since we have access to the, uh, the actual um, tissue samples is a lot more easy to work with genetics from, from the tissues. But yes, it is possible to, um, to, acid, to work with uh, DNA extracted from feces. I actually did that in my master's and uh, it worked quite well to understand um, social behavior of these um, individuals. But we can talk about this later more. Um, go ahead. Um, and so, well, we started talking about genetics already. So uh, this photo here uh, of this uh, very um, decomposed carcass uh, is just remind me to tell you that uh, even, uh, even carcasses in this stage of decomposition um, is uh, it, it's still enough um, to get some DNA samples. So uh, when you find we find them, we, we take a, a little piece of them to be able to analyze. And we also use, um, as Felipe mentioned before, the biopsy darts. So this is a, an example of um, what the sample looks like. And we have two main um, areas um, inside um, genetics, inside taper genetics. One um, focus is to look into relatedness among individuals. Um, so we, we know who, which individual is closer to, to which individual. And this um, helps a lot in understanding social behavior that um, Philippe was mentioning before about um, the overlap of home ranges in Pantanal. We see um, he showed the picture with a, a, lot of, um, a lot of overlap in between different individuals. And so we don't know the relationship between them yet. Uh, we, are, we are working on that. We are hopefully going to get the, this ready soon. So it's um, very interesting for social behavior and um, for inbreeding and for dispersal patterns as well to understand this. The other um, focus of the genetic work that we are doing is to is landscape genetics. So it's basically to understand distribution of the populations of tapirs across Brazil. So they have a very wide distribution as I showed you in the map, right? They, they cover four um, very large biomes. And uh, we are trying to understand um, the connection in between the, the biomes. This is, is particularly important for uh, management, for management of these wild populations in, in a continental scale. So we know that, um, that the Atlantic forest, for example, is in a much um, poor condition than, than the um, Pantanal or Amazon. So if they are, they are exchanging individuals with the Pantanal, for example, that is good news. That would mean that uh, we are still hopeful for the populations in Atlantic Forest. This is just one example, but uh, so, so you can um, understand the idea of working with populations of shapers. Go ahead. And um, we just, we cited a few um, studies, but we actually have um, published so many um, papers through the times. It's, it's very nice, um, not only we, but our collaborators, of course, and we would not be able to do this by ourselves. And we have been the, the main contributors to um, taper scientific knowledge. And we are going to um, give um, a link to all the publications later, or maybe it's already available. Yeah, Julia made it available. Thank you. So go ahead, Philippe. So um, now that we uh, we briefly summarized uh, the the studies that we do, how do we act after we we get the information? 
So this is one of example in Cerrado, as Gabriela told already, road queue is one of the major threats for the population in Cerrado. Uh, we, uh, we found more than 300 carcasses, but uh, with this information, we start to collect information of other uh, sources. And since 2003, uh, sorry, 2013, uh, we, we realized that there was at least 700 uh, road killed tapers uh, that we registered. And you can imagine that we can only register the, the ones that are found dead uh, on the road. Many of them get hit by a car and, well, enters in the forest and die after. So this is a really alarming number, but it's still very, very underestimated. But, well, what we did with this information, so we made a rank of the deadliest uh, uh, highways in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, where we've been collecting this information. Uh, and we did a hotspot analysis to, to understand, um, to know exactly where were uh, those collisions were happening, in, in specifically in which places. And we went there to find ways uh, to mitigate this. So we made a report out of it and uh, we sent to the government, to the uh, environmental and infrastructure agencies uh, that are um, responsible to, for maintaining these, these highways. And uh, well, at the first attempt, they didn't really pay the, too much attention on it. So we tried to be a little more uh, incisive and uh, incisive. And we, we started a uh, uh, judicial proceeding against them. So finally, they started to pay attention on it. And uh, now we, we start to, to reach an agreement and they started to implement some of the mitigation measures that we proposed that are basing, uh, basic uh, use of, using uh, fencing and uh, under, under passes for, for, for tapers. And we are reaching uh, uh, something. Another example that I would like to give is about this fires. Uh, as I told you, fire start to become uh, become a real a real big problem, uh, especially in Pantanal. And uh, in 2020, there was a massive uh, wildfire. Over 700 million uh, animals got killed during this this fire. But if we can have a, a positive outcome out of it. A lot of people worldwide uh, start to pay attention on it and try to help. So there was a lot of volunteers uh, going to Pantanal, uh, try to uh, to have rescue animals or to stop and control the fire. But we realized that there was not enough uh, equipment and supplies for this, all these people there. So what we did was start to raise funds. And there was a lot of people uh, worldwide uh, giving funds at that moment. And we bought those necessary supplies and we sent them. And after this chaos uh, ceased, we we had we said we have to learn with it and we have to prevent that something like this uh, never more happens again. So what we did uh, was to oh, sorry to start. Uh, uh, or to articulate a creation of a coalition of different ranches in Brazil for them to have their own uh, uh, fire brigade, uh, local community fire brigades. I forgot to tell that Pantanal uh, sometimes is quite difficult to reach. Uh, there are no roads, so you, you can reach some places only by, by boat or by airplane. Uh, so when the government starts to do something, sometimes it's too late. So when po the local population are able to fight fires, uh, we, we probably have better results. So we, we bought a lot of equipments, really good ones, and we organized a good training for them as well. Uh, and now we are finally uh, start to monitor uh, the, the success of, of, this, uh, of this intervention and, and seeing if they are like using it to, to, to control fires. Uh, so, as I told you as well, communication is one of our main uh, activities in LCTI. Uh, so we do uh, educational activities as well, environmental education, but we are a small team and we cannot reach a lot of people. So we created uh, this uh, guide of uh, environmental activities using tapers, the taper track, 
uh, Julia probably will, will put the, the, the link for the PDF on the chat as well. And we started to, to spread this, uh, this guide to different schools, zoos, to be able to use it and, and spread information about papers. Uh, we love to talk about papers. Uh, and Patricia, as Gabriela said, is a really good communicator. So we are part of different platforms of communication like TED, like NAGEO, Woman in Science, Conservation Optimism. And always that we have the opportunity to talk about papers on TV, on the magazines, we are all trying to do this. We want that people understand the importance about, about papers. Uh, sometimes we try to reach uh, other kind of public as well. So this uh, uh, artwork was done by a taper in a zoo. So we did an art exhibition with different paintings, but also photos of, uh, uh, of photographs, uh, wildlife photographs. In back in 2013, it was really, really nice. There was a big coverage uh, of media and we are planning to do another one soon, maybe next year. Uh, scientific tourism. So uh, in Pantanal, especially uh, the range where we, we do the, our study, they, they, they do uh, husbandry is the main activity, but also they receive uh, tourists to to do kind of safaris uh, in, uh, in Pantanal. And uh, when we are there, we always uh, have like some interaction with this tourist. We bring them to have a field zone experience, a hands-on experience on the field. And, uh, and yeah, we think this is really important also. We, we normally, Patricia say that we kind of do a brainwash in people and after they do this kind of uh, interaction with us, they, they start to love papers and they spread the word also about the importance of papers. And, and training and capacity building. So uh, LCTI uh, is a really, we, we like to say that we are a hub. We help to train uh, the new conservationists of the future. Uh, so in all the expeditions, we always have uh, trainees and uh, volunteers uh, students of vet or biology or other areas and we are really happy to receive these people and, and help them as much as we can to learn and to go back to their uh, homelands to go back to their place and start their own uh, conservation project uh, this guy here uh, maron he he did one field excursion with us and now he is uh, conducting a really nice uh, project of reintroduction of tapers in, in the Atlantic forest. So uh, I guess this is one of our main, main activities. One of our most important thing is training and capacity building. So, and, but of, of course we cannot do everything alone. So we have a huge institutional support behind, behind us. A lot of organizations uh, that help us with different uh, activities. And of course, uh, financial support, uh, a lot of zoos and a lot of uh, uh, foundations that believe in our work and, and, and allow us to, to do what we do. Uh, I guess in summary, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I guess we, we can start to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. What an awesome talk um thank you to both of you so there are a few questions in the chat also people feel free to put your hand up and we can ask you you can say your question directly but in the meantime i'll just find the couple that were said in the chat so um we've got one that says what about buying land and setting it aside for taper conservation in pentanalo um Could be interesting, I guess, but uh, this is not uh, what, what we've been doing. Uh, uh, Pantanal, uh, like we work in partnerships with uh, the landowners. And uh, for example, the, the, the land where we study, uh, they, they still have this traditional husband, husband, husbandry. So they, they, they are kind of nice to the environment. And that's why uh, it's, uh, it's not a threat for uh, tapers there. Uh, I guess if we buy land, would be a much uh, we would need a much more uh, 
uh, much more structure, I guess, we would not be able to, to deal with all of this. So I guess it's not our focus, but if someone do this, it would be amazing. I don't know if uh, Gabriela wants to say something as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, 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 is, it would be something cool to do, and, and we could uh, just study the tapers in this land that we buy. But uh, the distribution of tapers is very wide. And so uh, we're not able to cover um, a very large area by, by buying, uh, especially, um, as I said before, Pantanal is 95% um, owned already. And so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not simple to, um, to buy a land large enough to, to be like, meaningful to the conservation of tapers. Especially because it's extremely expensive as well. All those lands, they, they, they are productive lands, you know? so they are really valuable for crops and whatever. So, yeah. But there are, I know there are like institutions, uh, foundations that work only with this, like buying lands to, to preserve. So I guess this is a, a niche that some organizations uh, are, are trying to, to, to reach and try to yeah, that, that's totally valid. And, and a lot of people are working with ecotourism there as well in this lens. Thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question, Bilal. Um, there's a second question here that says, do the pitfall traps result in injuries to the tapers? Uh, no, at least with us, there was never an accident with tapers. They are really like strong and, and massive and it's not a big fall for them. Uh, we did have people falling in those traps and they got a bit injured. <laughs> and this could be a problem, but uh, normally we solve it's just like small injuries. It's nothing really important. But yeah, but we doesn't like to use this kind of trap because it's really difficult to dig a huge hole. And uh, when it rains, it gets flooded. So it's not really easy to to, to use it but when we have the opportunity and when is the only thing we can use well, we use it how how deep are the holes two meters two right meters deep. and and the length is also two meters i guess at least two meters yeah and also yeah. Uh, one once you catch a taper you you have to to take them out you have to put the ground on it and, and make like a i don't know the name a ramp um, uh, something for them to go out so we destroyed yeah. the the hole and we have to do another so it's really really exhaustive to use this kind of, of trap it's a lot of digging um yes. <laughs> thank you um there's another question i think you answered that one already um how difficult is it to find carcasses and feces i imagine it varies a lot among biomes uh yes uh, uh for example here in the Cerrado, to find carcasses is quite easy, unfortunately. Uh, we drive from, we are in the middle of Brazil, we are uh, in the in Campo Grande city, and our sites in Amazon is almost two and a half thousand kilometers from here. I don't know this in miles, uh, no idea, sorry, but <laughs> 2,500 kilometers from here three days traveling and during this travel, we find a lot of carcasses uh, in, in the way. And uh, the, uh, dung is a little bit more difficult. There are places that it's really easy to find, but some other places are not. Sometimes they, they do uh, have latri latrines mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the forest. So it's not really easy to, to reach it but sometimes they just have them outside the field. So then we, we collect samples there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting that, that you asked that because my whole master's was about this, finding <laughs> tapir <laughs> feces in the Amazon. I did a master's, it was a more specific, smaller project in the Amazon. And uh, finding, finding feces was a, a, a big deal. It was very hard in, in the land. We would try to find, um, footprints and then to, to see, to follow footprints and, and to find um, samples that are fresh enough to be able to be used in analysis. 
So that can be quite challenging, actually. Um, in our area of study at, at that time, it was in a, in a reservoir. Um, we, uh, we chose to uh, look only into the water. Um, so they like to, to uh, book in areas of um, like water that, that's still, that, that's calm water. They like to, to go there. And so when we focused in these places, we were able to increase our sampling a lot. Yeah, I, I see what you, what you mean. Um, thank you. Um, another question um, is how long do the collars last until they fall off? Uh, so we we had two kinds of colors. In the beginning was stormboard colors. So we buttoned on the tapers, and after one year, most yeah, one year we we had to recapture them using uh, darts. Nowadays we have those kind of colors that fall uh, have those um, uh, well gears that falls uh, along. So we set them to fall after a year. They do last uh, for. 18 months, but we prefer to, to, to make them get out uh, earlier. So after one year, we already have enough information about uh, all the movements of a taper and uh, yeah, that's it. And normally it's uh, one, um, one point, one uh, coordinate uh, each hour that the, we, we set also the, the colors to, to get. So in one day, 24 uh, coordinates. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, in captivity, tapers are housed in pairs a lot. Would it be better if they were housed alone, if they're solitary creatures? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I can question. try. <laughs> <laughs> they are solitary, but not that much. Like, they, uh, in our camera traps, like 80 For, for example, for females, 90% of the, the images are, they are long and, uh, sorry, 80%, 10% they are with their uh, mate, uh, with their pair, and 10% with their offspring. But, well, this is what we see uh, as humans, but they do interact with other tapers uh, through signs to like spray of urine, poo, So they are all the time interacting out with other tapers, not always uh, together, but somehow together. So I guess in zoos, uh, we don't have enough experience in zoos. Maybe Patricia would have a little bit more, but I guess it's, it's fine. They, 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 they are good uh, in, in the, uh, with other tapers. But I, I think also it's a matter of, uh, uh, Of like, of the interactions. If you put two males together, they would probably fight. If there is a female, or if you put a pair, it's better. But well, you have to see according to their behavior. Yeah, I'd expect that siblings would do better together as well. It's kind yes. of thing. But but as Felipe said, we we work mainly with wild um, species, with the wild uh, individuals. So I know there is. Uh, What's There's somebody name? here of, of like the breeding. Yes, breeding program that, we with that could answer, answer this videos. much better than us, <laughs> but no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I guess. Okay. I, I think the pressure is being felt. Uh, <laughs> I think Stephanie has left, so I don't think she's around anymore. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so we have one last question then, and then we'll have to wrap up because it's nearly time. But um, we have this last question. Have you tried to model habitat suitability and connectivity for the species? Yes, we actually have just one paper that got out recently on, on this, like really recently. I received it um, two days ago from uh, Patricia, sent it to us. Uh, she has a paper of this. I'm trying to find the link while I'm talking to you to be able to send it. Um, do you have anything yeah. to say about it, Felipe? No, yeah, we do have these partnerships with a lot of uh, researchers for from all around the world. So, well, we do a lot of field work, 
we are at least 200 days uh, during the year doing field so we are not able to uh, analyze all our our data so normally we give those data to other researchers and they 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 do this together with us so yeah about the habitat use we had this one uh, there is another paper uh, that is the one that calculate home ranges that has a little bit more information also about uh, habitat use of papers. So yeah, we are we are publishing some information related to that. Awesome. Um, on that note, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here. I think everyone here can agree that that was a really interesting and really informative presentation and webinar. And thank you for answering the questions as well. Um, I'll be sending out um, all of the information that we've spoken to to everyone who's attended today. So don't worry if you weren't able to catch all the links, we'll be sending them out to you as well as the recording. Um, remember to fill in the post webinar feedback survey just to make sure that we can continue to talk about things that are interesting to everyone um, on this platform. Um, look out for future webinars, there's one every single month. So we advertise them regularly on social media or on our website. Um, but thank you so much for everyone who has attended today and thank you for being engaged and asking questions and really a massive thank you to Felipe and Gabriela for host for giving us this webinar today. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed it and um, we'll hopefully be seeing you next time as well. So thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Thank that was you. fun. It was a it's awesome. Um, so yeah, so I'll end the call in a second. So, but yeah, once again, um, thanks everyone and, and bye. Have a nice day or evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.